Welcome to the Adventures in CRE audio series. Join Michael Belasco and Spencer Burton as they pull back the curtain on everything commercial real estate and introduce you to some of the top minds in the industry. If you want to take your skills to the next level and be part of a growing community of CRE professionals across the world, this is for you. Hello and welcome back to the Adventures in CRE audio series. So I know we call it an audio series and uh, primarily that's because we used to record these in seasons, but due to COVID, this is almost becoming a podcast now. So today we have a really cool episode. Uh, it kind of comes from the context of what we do day to day in Adventures in CRE. And to kind of cue this up, I'm going to turn it over to Spencer to tell us what we're talking about and how we can help you guys learn more about ACRE and uh, what it means to you guys. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we get emails all day long, um, and, and we love those. Uh, and a lot of them are really interesting um, questions around careers and modeling and the like. And we got a question in this week. Um, actually, came in through our accelerator forum. Um, and th this particular individual asked about. Well, first off, he. He shared that in in his office, um, there are certain more senior folks who they have just this innate ability, and and he works in a value add shop. This innate ability to quickly assess a deal and either pass on it or say, yeah, this is worth spending some more time on. And 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 he was asking like, what are some tricks to get there? And uh, and so that's what really this audio episode is about. We're going to talk specifically about like back of the envelope, quick and dirty value add in, uh, investment analysis, but it can really relate to any like tricks, Michael, uh, me, Spencer, <laughs> uh, any <laughs> tricks that, that we've learned over the years that helps us like quickly assess the viability of the deal and either move on or spend more time on that. Um, so let's start actually with Michael. Uh, in your experience, in in the various value add or even development deals because i think it relates there as well like what's one way where you what what have you learned as a way that you can quickly look at a deal assess it and either pass on it or know that it's a deal we're spending more time on yeah i think it boils down to well first understanding the market you have to have a baseline right um knowing the market so what deal you're what deal you're looking at if it's a value add deal in particular you need to know what that opportunity would look like at stabilization. And so you'll look at some some very baseline metrics. Um, you look at your, you know, what a typical NOI would be today, or, you know, in, in, in looking at it when you're evaluating it, that would be the cap rate on year one. Um, so you would look at it as a baseline. What would you pay? What would be the cap rate you would pay? And then you think about, okay, what would this building take to um, stabilize, what would you need to do to bring it up to market or to bring it up to what we would call maybe a core? How much would that cost roughly? And then back out to what you would pay for that. And then you would look at basically really, really the spread, right? Um, which we would call, and Spencer, I'll let you dive into the details, a yield on cost, compare that roughly to a cap rate. Um, and there's a couple more nuances we'll get into, but that's really the gist of it. If you know your market, uh, you know the asset type, um, you know, then you should be able to relatively easily at a high level, back of the envelope, back of the napkin, uh, you know, methodology in your head be able to get to an answer. Now, um, there's a couple more nuances to that, but that is how you can really get to it in your head. And it's not having this deep seated experience. It's just knowing the market, knowing some basic math and really getting to, to think about it at a high level. So I'll kind of stop there and kick it over to you, Spencer, to get a little bit more into details or give us your thoughts as well. Yeah, I, and I think it. So even stepping back before that, um, I think understanding your box is the first step to quickly assessing deals, right? So th some of this is simple. If if you invest in office buildings, then you don't look at a hotel, right? I mean, it, it start. It's, it literally is that simple. I call it a filter, whatever you want to call it but you've got a box that you live in and it may be the shop that you're working at, or it may be your own personal strategy. And by the way, if you don't have a box, uh, your life gets very, very difficult because then you, you don't know what to look at and what not to look at. So, so it starts with that box. And as soon as you have that box, you get to know exactly, uh, and this is to Michael's point, like you get to know that box. And so let's keep, let's come back to office as an example, right? It's like, 
uh, what type of office am I looking at? Am I looking at suburban or like, am I looking at CBD? What markets am I looking at? And again, it's, it's a filter to a certain extent. It's like, okay, this is the box I'm in. And so you can quickly, as deals begin coming in, you can filter for those elements that are the most obvious. Um, and so the first answer to the question is, you know, how do some of these guys and gals like quickly sift through some of us just take a look they know that uh, it's in indianapolis and we, we don't we don't do office deals in indianapolis indianapolis and it's that simple the next piece of it though is the analysis piece so let's imagine it is in a market that's of interest and it is the profile maybe it's the age maybe it's you're looking at suburban deals you're only looking at multi-tenant and and you're looking at in, in these certain markets and and it checks all those boxes and those are easy easy boxes to check at that point, then it gets to Michael's piece, which is the actual financial analysis. And the point that was raised by this particular reader is that how can you do that without pulling out an Excel, running a full DCF, looking at the IRR, saying, yes, this is an IRR, an unlevered IRR above an eight, and that's what we, we, we expect. Um, how do you do that? And that's where the concept of yield on cost compared to market cap rate comes in. In development, we call that a development spread. In value add, I call it an investment spread. Everyone has a, a slightly different term for it, but it really it's it's that spread between the yield that you can earn at stabilization on your cost compared to the market cap rate for an otherwise stabilized building. Um, and, and doing that math is actually pretty simple. It doesn't take opening Excel, it doesn't take even, a, it doesn't even take a napkin and a pen of paper in a lot of cases. Um, so can, yeah, can, and I interject here just a little bit and see if, if maybe, um, uh, just to de deconstruct the, the problem just a little bit. So is, is potentially is one of the issues. It seems like you talked about a lot of different scenarios, right? There were instances where you were talking about different types of transactions and, you know, if you start here, then here, and you talked about a box is, is the underlying problem that most of the time people potentially look at too broad of a spectrum of transactions and the best way to start getting this it's almost like an intuition it's a feel for those is to pick one specific niche and and get and get that dialed in and then maybe and then maybe be able to model that to the others is that is mm -hmm. are we are we having a problem because we're going too big yeah. at the mm -hmm. on that? I, I would say a little bit, maybe Spencer, you would, uh, we disagree that. on I, this point, but yeah, I'd love I to hear. Think, did I just stir up the, the hornet? No, no. I think, I think the problem is, um, every you, people overthink it. I've overthink things for years. Right. I mean, and I, you know, you come around to realizing, you know, when you talk to people that become your mentors and people that have become really successful in the industry, uh, and you hear them talk, you start to hear them think, and it comes down to very basic math. And we go really deep. So it's almost like there are a lot of there are a lot of people that I know that are in many asset classes and many markets, and that's a knack. They know they understand value, right? Um, in a lot, and it goes wider. That's where Spencer and I have a little bit of a, a disconnect. But um, when people ask, "How do I do this quickly?" Right? It's like, "How much do I have to memorize? How much do I have to cram in my head to be able to know it?" There's a, there's, um, to me, it's, there's like a gift in the simplicity of it. If you can figure out, boil it down to what really matters, do some math. And, you know, this is stuff that took me years to learn. I mean, I'm recently learning all this stuff about how to boil it down to the basic points, right? Real estate, what do you have to know? You know, equity multiple, IRR, all these metrics you need Excel to do for you. And in a lot of ways, it comes down to the sim simple simple formulas and simple math that helps you get to the back of the envelope answer. And then you go and you underwrite it and maybe you're so, off by one or 2% or, or well, maybe it's are, large. But that's a, yep. So are you saying that the, the problem is, what, what are you saying? Be, because I'm saying when you look at a, a big real estate investment or small real estate investment, you know, you're trying to match up these metrics, which are important to know and you need Excel for it. Right. And, um, and so you, 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 to me, and maybe this is different for some people, you start with the process and you need to get this really, you need to get in depth and you need to get a good answer. Even when you're doing a first round underwriting, you got to throw it into pro forma, you know? Um, well, how do you, and you spent in the accelerator, Spencer, uh, you know, Spencer's first course, right? Direct cap, you know, um, it hits on that. So 
to me, it's understanding when you're doing it in your head, it's getting the simple math. What are the simple go-to math equations I need to do, right? Uh, to me in your head, it's, it's, it's take that, you know, take the cap rate against the yield on cost. That's the first thing, right? And what does it roughly cost? What's dollar per square foot? What do buildings sell for in this market? These are not um, complex math problems. They're math. You just numbers you need to know and simple formulas. So, um, so let's, think let's, switch over to, it will, let's switch over to Spencer and see, because yeah, yeah. this has obviously been de uh, debated between the two of you. So Spencer, your thoughts. Well, I was on a little bit of a different topic. So, uh, you know, maybe Michael and I weren't on the same page there. So I was speaking the, about the box and Michael's view, and I, I hate to put words in his mouth, but we've talked about this at, at, to, to a certain point where I think I'm my, the words I'm saying are right. Michael's view is if you're opportunistic, you're somewhat agnostic to location, to property type. It's like, let's go out and find deals that where there's opportunity. And I totally get that. If I'm new as an investor, okay, and so I'm not working for someone, um, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do my first investment. I'd like to specialize. And mm -hmm. that way I, I get to know a market and I get to know a property type and I get to know a niche within that property type. And then once I know that, then I can start broadening that. Um, Michael, on the other hand, and I, I, I think a lot of people are like him and, and, and I celebrate it uh, if, if you have that ability. Uh, to say, you know, I'm just going to go out and find good deals. And, and and my issue with that is you spend so much time looking for good deals because you don't have the ability to sift down to what is your specialty. Mm. It, I, I, so I, I agree and, and disagree. And, you know, the, the beauty of your perspective of like going deep is that you really know it. It's almost like your life gets easier. You know, it's like you get really comfortable, you know, and things you get really deep and you really understand it where when you're constantly looking all over the place, uh, you know, Spencer, you and I have these conversations just about even like in life in general about like getting into like a, a direct path and your life gets easier. And part of it is like you learn a lot, but you are scattered and you do need to like hone in. Um, it's just a faster learning curve to me. If you're going, it's a harder learning curve. If you go, if you go and expand into all these classes, asset classes, but um, you know, there are a lot of people that are very successful that have done that, and they're sparked by their curiosity and just if they find something they're passionate about. Um, you know, is that you know we have we've had Alex Sakakis on on the show, and he's a guy that um, you know Capstone Advisors, where he's always been. Find my find something that I'm passionate about or something that excites me and go after it and learn about it. And you know, he's had remarkable su success. And I've always kind of looked to that as like a as yeah. like an aspiration. Uh, and that's not the only way, like you said. I mean, yeah, he's yeah, great. That's a, good, that's a good example. I think it takes a personality type. So my mind just doesn't work that way. So I can't say the entire world of real estate is my investment strategy, and I'm just going to find good opportunities. Because I would get so bogged down in the the deluge of opportunities that come in, I'd never be able to find the right one. Where it's, it's if I said, okay, I'm only going to look at um, single tenant industrial under 150,000 square feet in secondary markets on the uh, you know the Western United States. Now, now I've got like some focus, and 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 then I know which brokers to talk to. I I, I know which properties to spend some time on. And now we can get to actually the 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 the, the, the math, um, which which Michael kind of presented a little bit. Um, but if you're interested in the quick and dirty way, let let's take my industrial. If I can go here now, guys, or or am I pushing this too fast? Well, no, can, can so, I, I actually did kind of want to ask one thing before okay. we maybe get into the nitty gritty because we've kind of jumped from spectrum to niche to spectrum to niche, and I'm wondering just to kind of maybe give some streamline some a, a little bit of congruency here both of you are there some principles and some things that you both would agree okay whether you're in the box or whether you're being adaptable are there some things that at a foundational level these are the things you need to like have down like you need to feel really good about these whatever things are there some things that you guys think you agree on there? And then no, we, we disagree that, about everything. <laughs> <laughs> those are the foundational principles to start from. Yeah. 
Uh, Take it away. I guess I'll hand it over to Spencer first. Okay. Foundational principles of, uh, in terms of. Well, you're talking about the envelope. Yeah. Kind of stuff. yeah. Let's have a, start, a place where we can start. Yeah. I, I mean, you need to have rules of thumb. That's mm. important. All right. And, and the rules of thumb ought to match the market as best they can. And some of those you just learn over time. You need to have rules of thumb. And that, that speeds along your underwriting. When you have those, more, more than likely they're going to be 90 to 95% right. And, and that moves you along quicker. And you use those rules of thumb to do this really quick math that we'll talk about in a second. Okay. And, and then you can move on Be, because there, if not, there are literally hundreds of deals that you could look out, look at every month and, and you Waste just don't enough time in the day to, yeah. to, to do the, the deep analysis that you need to do on every deal. Okay. Anything to add to that, Michael? Yeah. I just actually was going to ask Spencer, when you say rules of thumb, you're 95% correct. What do you mean by that? Yeah. What I mean by that is, uh, so I'm going to use an industrial example in a second. So it might be your uh, TI assumption, All right? What is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, or yeah. even even simpler than that, the leasing cost, the total leasing cost, so TI plus leasing commissions as a per square foot for a typical tenant in your market, All right? And so mm-hmm. then I can use it as an example. Let's Let's say that we have an empty industrial building in Salt Lake City, okay? Uh, it's selling for a hundred bucks a foot. Uh, it's, it's, it's a small format kind of last mile building, um, newer, let's say, you know, 27 foot height. Well, that's probably too high, but anyway, you get the idea. 24 foot clear height, whatever. Okay, so hundred bucks a foot and rents in that market for that type of building, 10 bucks a foot. Just general rules of thumb, 10 bucks a foot. But but it's empty, okay? And it's going to cost you 20 bucks a foot to lease the thing, okay? So you're 100 bu- bucks a foot to buy, you're 20 bucks a foot to lease, and, and that 20 bucks a foot includes TIs, leasing commissions, carry costs to get you to that point. And, 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 but once you're there, and, and let's assume triple net leases, so that 10 bucks a foot is your, is your NOI, your yield on cost is 10 divided by 120. So what's 10 divided by 120? It's 8.33%. That's your yield on cost. What could you buy that exact building for today? Or what would the cap rate be for a building like that today, fully leased at 10 bucks a foot? Let's say it's seven, a seven cap. So we're, we're buying and leasing this up at an 833 yield on cost. We could buy it, the building next door that's identical to it, same credit tenant, same everything, at a seven cap. That means there's 133 basis points of premium, investment spread, development spread, whatever you want to call it, between this value add opportunity and a core opportunity next door. Mm. Is that 133 basis points of premium sufficient to account for the risk and time and cost inherent in taking a vacant building and getting a lease. Yeah. So the security and, around it. Yeah, sorry, I thought you were- Yeah, no, and so, so my, my final point about that, and, and here's the math. Uh, and in fact, we shared a, a blog post this last week that that provided this math, so I, I can link to that. But um, it's a really, really, really easy analysis to do. analysis to do. You already have your box. You've got your rules of thumb, which allow you to do this analysis. And then you'll likely have a rule of thumb that says, is that 133 basis points sufficient? You might say, okay, the, our type of business, we expect 75 basis points for this sort of deal. And here we got more than 75. And therefore, this is a deal that's worth spending more time on. And Anything now this, to add to that, Mike? Yeah, Spencer's point, having the box, right? Knowing what the leasing commissions are, that's where like those things, when you have a guy in your office who you can just, he's the senior guy and he knows this stuff like that. I mean, that's where like, oh, you'd have to call brokers. You have to do some research. You have to figure that out, you know, without, mm. without being deep into that, you know, that's, that's that piece. But yeah, no, I think, I mean, that's a great, as always, you have these great simple examples that really illustrate the point. Um, so yeah, no, I think it's a great example. Yeah. So I, I think as a person listening to this, if, if, if you're thinking, Hey, I would like to be more proficient at this. Is it as easy as going and finding that person? Because the the premise of this topic was that this student or or this reader had reached out 
had reached out and said, uh, there's people in my office that can do this really quick. Is it as simple as reaching out to those folks and saying, hey, listen, there's a couple of things I'd like to have a conversation about some, and, and gain some context. Is it as much as just like opening your mouth and, and, and getting, you know, that relationship building and asking, you know, being willing and maybe even vulnerable to, to like ask the questions and find out that particular, you know, those niche pieces of information. Is it that simple? Yeah, that's, that's one way. In fact, if you do that with senior people, you know, that shows your level of interest and in, in wanting to engage and improve your, yourself within your career. So yeah. Uh, I think that's a fantastic way to go about it. I mean, you know, Spencer, I'm sure you have people coming, you know, up to you asking you how to do that stuff. It kind of shows you, okay, this is a guy I want working with me and for me because he wants to learn the things that, that I know and what I've done to get to where I am today. So yeah, it's a great, great option. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. Um, uh, number one, it helps your career, but th like that's how you learn. So deal seasoning is a very real thing. When we talk about deal seasoning, a lot of it is this Lear learning the rules of thumb for your area of expertise. And the more deal seasoning you get, the more, you know, this is the leasing commission in Las Vegas. Um, you know, it, it, we're a 625 on a new lease in Las Vegas. And, and I don't know if that's the case, by the way, just throwing that. Whereas in, in San Francisco, uh, it's 575, five. you know, those little tiny things, um, you learn over time, but you can speed along that learning to your guys's point by asking yeah. and engaging with more senior people and showing a genuine interest in learning and, and developing that seasoning that you need to be able to do this faster. Well, that's great. Well, uh, kind of in conclusion, any final words, anything you want to add to that to summarize anything we want to make sure that people just, you know, as far as a takeaway, one takeaway from each of you, I guess. Um, yeah, for me, I think the big idea is, um, you know, first this was a conversation around, you know, how to do something or how to, how to figure out the cheat sheet to fast, you know, to quickly evaluate whether an opportunity is, is worth it or not, at least with the back of the envelope approach. And I think just the higher level concept here is constantly figuring out ways how to get better and learning. And, and honestly, it's kind of weird, it almost culminated with your question, Sam, which is what's a great way to do that and like reach out and, you know, um, you know, ask your superiors, you know, really, really utilize those people as resources. It's a great value add. It's a great way to have conversations and connectivity with them as well. So um, I know this was not about that, but it kind of culminated into that, which I think is really great. So that's, that's my last piece of parting yeah. advice, so to speak. Awesome. Yeah, mine is, uh, it, it actually comes from a professor we had at, uh, in grad school who, uh, he, he explained this concept of modeling. Like your model is only good, as good as your inputs. And so you may know how to build a beautiful model. If you don't actually know the inputs, then it, there's no value in, you don't have much value, I guess, to the process. And so while real estate financial modeling is key, especially earlier in your career, it's equally as important to get to know the inputs, know like what goes into, yeah, you can do quick analysis, but if you don't actually know what inputs to even go into the quick analysis, uh, you won't, you won't be able to add much value. So know, know your business, know your trade. It seems to me like uh, there is no shortcut, but if if we were to give any credence to a quote shortcut, that would be engage others who know. See if you can get some mentorship. See if you can, uh, you know, get some, uh, you know, some credible answers that will help you, uh, you know, just do better, make better decisions. So, uh, thanks, you guys. This has been a really fun, uh, informative episode. So, thank you, listeners, and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Adventures in CRE audio series. For show notes and additional resources, head over to www.adventuresincre.com slash audio series. Would you like to learn real estate financial modeling in a matter of weeks and do it with zero guesswork? If so, the ACRE Accelerator is for you. The Accelerator is a step-by-step case-based program designed to teach you exactly what you need to know and in the order you need to know it, so you can gain both the knowledge and experience to take your career to the next level. 
To see if the accelerator is right for you, go to www.adventuresincre.com slash accelerator.